So please be seated. Uh, Penny Montgomery and I were talking right before the service this morning uh, about uh, how challenging it is uh, for Episcopalians, Anglicans, for deeply habituated Northern European introverts like myself to deal with anything that's different. You know, ch the change just makes a little shiver go up my spine sometime. And I said to her that the two Sundays uh, of the church year that always cause me the greatest sort of psychic trauma are St. Andrew's Day and Palm Sunday. And that's because those are the two Sundays where at the 11 o'clock service we start outside and come inside. I can never remember how to do it. Do we, does a cross go first? Does a choir go first? Do the bagpipers go first? Or who goes last? It's extremely confusing to me. And uh, 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 she said, you know, maybe somebody could write it down. <laughs> I've been here for almost 24 years. <laughs> I wonder why I never thought of that. I could write it down. Uh, uh, but, but actually, uh, when it comes to situations which I feel like I have the least control, uh, we're rolling right up to it this morning. Because at the 11 o'clock service, we have uh, what we uh, call uh, a children's pageant of Christmas. And uh, every year, our church school, they try to gather as many kids as they can who aren't already headed out to visit the grandparents or whatever, and uh, to have the children following some different scripts sometimes, uh, uh, but uh, to, to retell the story of uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, this year, it's particularly uh, interesting, and uh, uh, Brandon Cooper, our church school director, is sort of in my prayers, mostly just for his sanity and comfort, because uh, as the cohorts of our church school change over the years, uh, uh, you have different age distributions. And this year we have, uh, it's not a huge group of kids, but they're almost all under six. <laughs> and um, you know, they, they're sort of at the age where if that burlap costume begins to feel, uh, we begin to see disrobing shepherds right in the middle of the thing, and angels that suddenly decide they have to go to the bathroom, and there's just all kinds of chaos, and nobody remembers their lines and where they're supposed to stand. And, of course, the 12-year-old, the, the who is sort of the junior assistant director and archangel, is going crazy because her customary way of dealing with younger brothers and sisters and cousins is to kick them into line, but we won't let her do that here. She's not allowed to kick other children that are not a part of her family. So uh, it, it, it just is kind of wild. I sat through about 45 minutes of the 90-minute rehearsal yesterday morning, and I thought, well, it's going to be kind of interesting tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, but it's always interesting. Uh, it's always a little crazy. Uh, but we get the idea. Uh, the, the story is told. And uh, in some fresh way, uh, we are prepared uh, for uh, uh, what is to come as we turn our hearts and minds and attention to Bethlehem, to that silent night, holy night, and to the birth of the Savior. And uh, no matter, no matter how crazy it is, I always feel deeply touched by that retelling of the story and look forward to it. There's a lot of nostalgia as well. I remember when my own children were marching up the aisle as, as uh, kings and, and, and uh, uh, shepherds and sheep and all the rest. And, and uh, as we watch these kids, we see them grow as well and enjoy seeing the families as they get together. It's a blessing for us as we uh, do what really is the heart and soul of the church. And if people say, what is this place for? We asked this question. We had, to, we had a question the other night at a vestry meeting, as a matter of fact. Uh, and somebody said, well, yeah, so... so do we really have a mission statement that really tells us what St. Andrew's is for? You know, a lot of businesses will have mission statements like 
to sell more hamburgers than anybody else or something like that. And uh, so, well, we've, had, we've made efforts at writing mission statements over the years, but I would certainly say this morning uh, is uh, that, that at the very heart of our mission as a congregation, as a church, is to remember the story and to tell it. And we remember the story and we tell it over and over and over again in so many ways. And uh, it, uh, it, it makes it possible for the Holy Spirit to work all around the lives of men and women and boys and girls, angels, archangels, shepherds, magi, and all the rest uh, to, to hear the story and to learn it to be touched and to be brought into Christ's presence. And certainly my prayer for the children and their families, for all of us as we come into this season, is that uh, we would, all of us, uh, have the opportunity to hear the story afresh and to be enlivened by it and to be brought, brought closer to Christ. This third Advent Sunday uh, has a traditional name. Uh, it comes from the old Latin introit. You know, we have these sort of residues of former lectionaries. The lectionaries go away, but we still call the, the Sundays by the old name. And this Sunday is called Gaudete Sunday. Uh, it's a Latin word. Uh, we know it's Gaudete Sunday at St. Andrews because the acolyte remembers to light not the pink candle, but the rose candle. Boy, people get crazy if you say the pink candle. It's the rose candle. And uh, the, the rose candle is lit. In some churches where the altar guild has an unlimited budget, there are rose-colored vestments and paraments in all of the churches as well uh, for this day. And uh, the, the introit for this Sunday, the old introit, like, like back when, when Moses was a young man, was was from Philippians 4, beginning at the fourth, fourth verse. This is always a good memory verse, too, if you're looking for a memory verse. Uh, Paul is sort of beginning a very long farewell in the, the sort of the whole last chapter of, of the, the letter to the Philippians. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And uh, so that rejoice in the Latin translation of the Bible from St. Jerome's time, that word is gaudete. And so the choir would sing the epistle in that way. And the, the candle and the name reminds us that this is to be a, a, a day and a time and a season and a life of rejoicing uh, and because the Lord is near. Uh, one of the recent traditions about this season uh, in some corners is a conversation about the war on Christmas. You ever you hear about the war on Christmas? The, the uh, war on Christmas has to do with people who say, uh, is it okay to say happy holidays? or Merry Christmas. And so if, if somebody says Happy Holidays, that's part of the war on Christmas. And uh, the, of course, from the church's point of view, the problem is not the war on Christmas. The problem is the war on Advent. Uh, the problem is uh, happy and merry, not holidays and Christmas. Uh, because uh, what the church calls us to in this season of Participation and preparation. Happiness. I mean, okay, be happy. You know, <laughs> who am I? Uh, uh, it's not merriment, not happiness and merriment, uh, but instead joy. Uh, the wonderful colic at evening prayer. Almighty God, whose blessed Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Uh, joy is something quite different from happiness and something quite different from merriment. Joy is something that, that roots down deep into the heart and the soul and the spirit, uh, not because of some fleeting uh, uh, toy or refreshment, uh, but instead because of the sense, as Paul says, that the Lord is near. 
This is the message of Advent. It's the message of our Christmas pageant this morning. It's the message of this Holy Communion and all our lives. Rejoice in the Lord always and again. I say rejoice. The Lord is near.